How many trust in God this morning? I tell you what, I've, it's been interesting the last couple of weeks. I got to go down and spend time at Light of the World Church in Atlanta. You know, it's always good to see your spiritual children and to see what God's doing in their lives. But God has been dropping just a lot of things into, uh, just into my lap, both on the good side and on the bad side of intelligence. How many know the enemy's still working? But what, what is interesting, we got to listen last night to uh, uh, Chaplain Lindsey Williams. And he was sharing about the word from the global elite. And what's interesting and what's exciting me is what they had planned. You know, it was supposed to go in, it's supposed to happen about 2006. Then, then, no, 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 now it's going to be about 2010. Now, the, it was all supposed to collapse by the end of 2012, and now they're talking about 2016. How many know that God is still reigning? They can make their plans, and God can frustrate their plans, and he can say, excuse me, I've got a plan, and it's going to happen according to my plan. Is stuff going to get bad? Yeah, but it's going to get bad on God's timing, just like he said in the Word of God, not according to their timing. And I'm seeing God is getting very strategic about some things. We've already shared how that Dr. Benefield came up with the the prayer of the divorcing of Baal and how he did that in Washington and and some of the things that have affected that. And I think that's one of the reasons why this thing is getting elongated. God's going to say, you know what, I'm I'm doing some things. You're going to have to wait for your one world government, and you're going to tell the Antichrist he's just going to have to hold just for a little bit now because I got something I want to do. Tonight, when you go home, go Google Rabbi Khan's inaugural prayer breakfast address. That little feller can preach. They took it off YouTube today? Well, there's another link. There was one they took off last night, but it was back up on another. They took it off YouTube. Well, we're going to find it again. And the reason was that rabbi stood in an Elijah anointing. And he preached repentance. He gave a challenge to the president. How can you put your hand on a Bible and swear before a God that you won't do what he says in that book? And then, you know, it was, he had two Bibles. One was Abraham Lincoln's, and he said, this is what Abraham Lincoln said in the turn of the Civil War. And quote him, says, now, how can you not lay your hand on his Bible and not agree with that? And I mean, what, what, I, what I felt like God was doing was God saying, and he did it from Washington. He did it from the inaugural prayer breakfast. That is so significant because God is still ruling and reigning. Aren't you glad? I'm so excited I can't hardly stand it. God is good. God's got a plan. How many know God's got a plan for you? He's not done with you yet. And as we get into this morning, we're going into the Holy of Holies. We need to understand that God's not done with you yet. He wants you to get there. So much of the body of Christ spends all their time in the outer court because they never get rid of enough flesh to go into the inner court. And how many know that isn't good enough for biblical life? We want to, get, we want to do our service in the outer court so we can get into the inner court so I can begin eating at that table of showbread and having kingdom order established in my life. I want that wall the devil had set up. I want it tore down. I want free access to the throne of God. God wants you to have free access to his throne. And let me tell you something. I really believe 99.9% of believers have never really made it to the throne of God. If you ever get there, you don't want out. If you ever get there, you are radically changed. It goes from being religious to being a relationship. It goes from being just religious to functioning in a kingdom. And this morning, I want you to learn how to function in that kingdom. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Exodus chapter 25, starting in verse 10. And this is a description of the Ark of the Covenant. 
starting in verse 10, and they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, shalt thou overlay it, and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt... Uh, cast four wings of gold in it, and thou and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be on one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it, and thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and overlay it with gold, and thou shalt put the staves into the rings on the side of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. How many know God wants his ark born with you? He wants it to to go wherever you go. God never wants you to go a place in your life that his throne cannot be transported there. If God's throne shouldn't be there, maybe you shouldn't be either. Come on now. Let's go on. And the staff shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And they shall not be taken from it. God wants his throne to always stay mobile to where it can go wherever you go. And thou shalt put it in the ark, and thou shalt put in the ark the testimony which I will which I shall give thee, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and thou shalt make two cherubim of gold of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends and uh, in, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And one, uh, one cherubim on one end and the other cherubim on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high and cover the mercy seat with their wings and their face shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the face of the cherubim be and thou shalt put in the mercy seat uh, upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony which I shall give thee. How many know that was a long reading? But it's a very descriptive reading. And what I want to get into several things this morning. The first of when most people think of the mercy seat or the ark of the covenant, they kind of get this picture, which kind of goes with uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark type of thing, where you have both wings going together in the front and in the back, but many rabbinical scholars now believe it's, it's configured just a little bit differently. You have on the back, the, the wings touch each other, and on the front, they go down. In fact, there, there is in a, in, a, in a museum the true sword of Solomon. Now, the true sword of Solomon doesn't have fancy stars of David and all those different things on it, like everybody supposes. It actually has engraved the Ark of the Covenant on the blade. And on that ark, the front wings are going down. You know why? It's a throne. It's a throne. One of the things the rabbis have always known is the Ark of the Covenant represents God's throne on the earth. It is his throne. Now, where is his throne supposed to be? His throne is supposed to be in my spirit, man. When I made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of my lives, and I, and I, I received his redemptive work in my life, my spirit, man, was made alive again. And part of that process of making alive is God set his throne into my heart. Now, for me to be able to get to that throne... We're going to understand why the brazen altar was so important. You got to get the flesh off the throne. Are you hearing me this morning? You got to get the flesh off the throne. And right now we have a lot of flesh ruling in the body of Christ. A lot of flesh is actually uh, prescribing what is preached from the pulpit. When I was down in Atlanta, I got to meet with Bishop uh, Frederick Na. Now, Brother Na originated in Libya. And he began to tell me the whole story of, uh, of Libya in, in uh, Liberia. Liberia. There we go, Liberia, in, in Africa, and, and how that Christians after the Civil War actually went and bought that and said, if you wanted to go back to Africa, we're going to create a country for you. And they just took the U.S. Constitution and put, we the people of Liberia. 
It's a Christian state. Ninety. It was at one time 90% Christian. I think it's about 65. But you go in their state capital and they have roads like Hallelujah Boulevard. Okay? And they serve God there. And he said, now he said, I, I came to America to go to seminary. Then there was a civil war and I couldn't go back. So he, he's, he's kind of built his life here. But one of the things that has amazed him from someone who lived outside of Western culture that came into Western culture, he said, he says, I'm watching what is being preached on Christian television. He says, it's destroying your nation. Now, he's a, a bishop in the black community, and he says, I'll go down to jail, and these kids have been listening to these preachers preach hyper grace. And he said, they have stolen, they have raped, and they have murdered, and they are without remorse because they said grace has got it covered. That's the fruit of when you let flesh stay on the throne, when you let carnality stay on the throne, you end up with that, and it begins to skew what this word says. Literally, in the last days, we have people calling evil good and good evil. You are now mocked if you believe the word of God. You are now mocked by believers if you believe the commandments of God. You're mocked if you believe this word instead of just sliding greasy grace over it. And they're saying, it's okay all the things that we do because I have grace. Well, you may display your grace that way, but I display my grace by the power of God of crucifying the flesh and choosing to walk with God the way that he says he wants to be walked with. Now, which one is harder, just going with the flesh or crucifying the flesh? Jesus said, unless you take up your cross and follow me daily, you're not even worthy of me. It's time to get Mr. Carnality off the throne, kick him out, drag him out to that outer court, and go ahead in time to have a barbecue and let him be burnt up upon the altar so that God can rule and reign in our lives. A man that has learned to go into the Holy of Holies, Almighty God reigns in his life. Carnality and the flesh and carnal desires no longer rule and reign over him, but he is able to be with God and have God rule out, out through him, and he is the one who rules over those things. Oh, that's just good preaching right there. Now I want you to notice on this picture, there's blood sprinkled on the right side, never on the left side. The rabbis were taught by the Levites. God's instruction was you sprinkle the blood seven times God's complete salvation plan seven times on the right side. And where is Jesus seated? At the seated, seated. Oh, come on. Kick in brain. Where is he seated? At the right hand of God. Now, guys, the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat represent God's throne. And I want you to see how it's, how it's made. You have the bottom part of it. It's layered inside and out with holiness, with gold. And it has the testimony on the inside. And what we're going to see in a minute is what is on the inside of God's throne. These are the things on the inside of God's throne that are released into my life when he rules and he reigns. But the top of it, it's called mercy. It's called mercy. Why is that so important? Well, we're taught in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, seeing that we have a high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest that which cannot be touched with the feelings of infirmities, but was in all manners tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of what? Grace, so that you can receive what? It's the mercy seat. That I can come boldly to God's throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. 
This is not my notes, but this is, it came to mind. A lot of times we can never release that mercy and that grace that we need in a help of need because our carnality has never been burnt up on the brazen altar and it stands between us and the throne. That whole wall of strongholds stands between us and the help that we need. You know what I have found in my own life? Now, we, we covered this in the last session about overcoming those, that wall of strongholds. What I have found is I, I, there's something I'm needing from God. I, I need to come boldly before the throne of grace that I might receive mercy and receive that, find that grace in the, in the time of need. And so there's something specific that I'm needing. And I start going to God for that need, and I find out he starts working on the wall. Not the need. Have you ever done that? You ask God for A, and he starts working on G, or H, or I. And I have really never understood why. God, you know, but your word says, you know, if I ask, you know, if I ask for the Holy Spirit, or you're going to give me something else, if I ask for bread, you're not going to give me a rock. What's this deal? And I never really understood why when I'm asking for A, he starts working on I, or G, or whatever this is, until it dawned on me. The only way that A can make it out of the Holy of Holies into where I'm at, i got to take that wall down. That's why sometimes when, God, when you're saying, God, I need promotion at work, God starts working on your attitude. You know, if I found out if he can transform your attitude, he can increase your aptitude. Ouch. If he can get that stronghold that is causing me to be in the flesh and ornery or conniving or manipulative or whatever that stronghold is, if he can get that out of the way, he can release something new from the throne in me that is going to cause me to be promoted. That's why so many times when I pray for this, he starts working on this. It's to prepare you and to get you to the place where you can have this. You know what's amazing to me? Now, this is, this is a story of God's true throne, true throne. The Bible says when Lucifer fell, he was the anointed cherub that covered. Instead of two angels facing face to face, there was one angel that hovered and covered the very throne of God. His name was Lucifer. Now, what's amazing from, to me is from the throne of God came rebellion. From the throne of God came the first fall because Lucifer quit looking at God and began getting caught up in himself. He was the most powerful, the most beautiful of all the angels ever created. And so after his fall, God said, you know what? I'm going to create two more. I'm not going to allow one angel to cover. Well, you say, why is that so important? Because when you studied out in the Hebrew, God's throne is made up of angels. It's a chariot. And it's, it's made up of angelic hosts as his throne. And Lucifer was the canopy over the top of it. And so when God replaced Lucifer, he could make two of the most beautiful, the most powerful angels in all of heaven But they sat there, and now forever they're staring at one just as beautiful and just as powerful as them. They can't get lifted up in pride. Because self-pride should have had no place around God's throne. How could we ever be around God's throne and get caught up in ourselves? That was birth. That That is the true nature of iniquity. Iniquity can look at the manifested presence of God and turn away. And we have, I, I, guys, I've actually heard ministers that have seen some things in the Word and they, they know it's truth. They know it's truth. They won't preach it. Can't build a mega church on that. Well, how about building a real church? This last week I got a email from Liverpool and all of them over there are following the new American model of the emergent church for church growth and it's just not working. People, people are starving out. They're starving to death on that stuff. 
And he said, a bunch of us, we just, we just couldn't go no more. But he said, uh, in my living room, YouTube comes up, and now we have church around the Biblical Life YouTube channel every week. God's finding a people. Because iniquity don't reign here. Iniquity's been crucified here. And that's where I want it to stay. I want God to rule, and I want God to reign. Almighty God has got to be the epicenter of everything that we do. He has to be the centerpiece. If he's not, we're off someplace. That's why God says, don't go to the left hand. Don't move me anywhere except dead straight on. Because if, if everything that you have begins to flow from the throne, it's going to be empowered. But what we do in America, we have confused the church with democracy. Democracy does not belong in the church. It is a theocracy. God rules and reigns. And let me tell you something. I have found that when you let it become a theocracy, if the man behind the pulpit doesn't line up with God, God will remove him. Come on now. You know, it's, it's the best place to be, and for me it's also the scariest place to be. Because we're living in a time that people don't line up with the throne anymore. I've heard from several students this week. One of them said that she was listening to one of the lectures, and her bishop came in, and the bishop says, that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right, and didn't give her any scripture. And I thought, that's interesting. Then I heard from another one of my students, a male, it said that his pastor said, I'd like to listen to one of, uh, one of these sermons that you're getting so excited about because you're, you're about to come this unglued because you're so excited about what you're hearing. And so he sat down and played him a, one of the tapes. And the preacher said, that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right. And he just simply paused the tape and said, give me scripture and verse. The pastor stammered, stuttered, and said, because I said so. That's, that's the day and the hour that we're living in. we got to go back to the Word. The Word is always going to line up with the throne. You know really where the church is today? The church is today in the same sense as, the, as, the, as Israel was in the day of Jesus. We, we, had, we had the edifice called the temple. But you know when Jesus died, there was no Ark of the Covenant in Herod's temple. It never, ever, ever was there. The last temple to have the Ark of the Covenant in it was Solomon's temple. And it was taken away and never found again. In fact, Zechariah says it'll never be found again because it's supposed to be hidden in your heart. So the whole time they were going through all the things... And can you imagine, I mean, the high priest going through all the things, tying the rope, on, rope on, uh, on his leg and everything else and going in there, and he was sprinkling blood into thin air. There was nothing there to even put it on. There, there was no chabod of God. There was no glory of God there. There was nothing there. And right now in a lot of the body of Christ, they go through the motions, but there's nothing there except hype and the flesh. You know, sometimes we get excited in our praise and worship, but, you know, I try to kind of keep it a little calm because I, I can get Pentecostal. I can get, I can get charismatic. You guys didn't know I could dance, did you? I, I can dance. <laughs> Only under the unction of the Holy Ghost. If I do it otherwise, people get hurt. I'm sorry. You know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's like me and jokes. Jokes don't work unless I'm under the anointing. But I, I try to keep that to a minimum on purpose, if you will, because I don't want you to get caught up in emotion. I want you to get caught up in him. And see, I've been, I've been in services. There was one time in Germany that we were in a, in a home fellowship, and the presence of God just, just like a blanket. just. Phew. And we had little kids, younger than these two boys over here. And for 20 minutes, nobody said a word. Not even the little kids. They bowed their head and just, and just were worshiping in the presence of God. It was almost like it was so wonderful. You didn't want to move. You didn't want to say a thing to break his presence because that was so precious. It was so phenomenal. 
And actually, for some of the charismatics, it warped his theology because that silence broke when a girl gave a prophetic word before she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was later on in the service that she spoke with other tongues and all that, and everybody said, Lord, we have seen strange things today. You know, that, that kind of warped your theology. How many know God's God? And he'll do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. But we, in, in the excitement, he can be there, but in the excitement, he cannot be there if it's all just flesh. Years ago, Bob Mumford talked about a church he went to. And, uh, you know, you, you were, when you travel, you wear a nice suit, you wear nice shoes and everything. But everybody came in with sneakers into the church service. And he's going, what is this? And before church started, everybody took off their dress shoes and put on their sneakers. And he said, it was an aerobic workout. <laughs> He said, we had people doing backflips. We had everything else. And he said, I stood back, looked amazed at this. And he said, you know what? He said, they were praising, but there was no praise in their praise. It was all carnality. And we have a lot of churches today that they can get excited. They can get hyped. They can jump up and down and do all these things. But the throne of God is not established there. I want the real deal. I want the real thing. I don't want anything else in my life. And if God is saying, get excited before me, I want to get excited because one of the, the Hebrew words translated praise means to literally spin like a top, to get up and break dance. And you think that's funny? I've, guys, I've actually seen rabbis, because when, when we first got into Hebraic heritage, I looked up and I wanted to see what they were doing at Tabernacles, and there were a couple of rapper re, uh, rabbis that were rapping the Torah, and then one of them started spinning on his head. I went, well... I go do that. <laughs> but they, when God said be joyful, they were joyful. They were breakdancing. If I break dance, yeah, things will get broken, okay? I'm not going to do that. But there's a place for that. There's also a place just to fall before him in reverence. And you've got to do it not what you want, but what the Holy Spirit's moving to be done. That's one of the things that we try to do in every service. We try to find the groove that the Spirit of God is going into that day because if he's saying go more worship and I go more praise, I can have a flesh out but the Spirit of God doesn't get anything done. It's lining up with that throne. Now, I want to look at the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. There were three things in that Ark. Aaron's rod that budded, the Ten Commandments, and manna. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute because out of God's throne comes three things. Now, you know the story about Aaron's rod and why it budded? Because you had one of the guys said, I, 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 I want to take Aaron's place. I don't think Aaron's the right man for the job. Because he realized that Moses wasn't actually the most powerful position in all of Israel. It was the high priest. If the high priest controlled the temple, it controlled all of Israel. And the rabbis say that this guy was actually the accountant for Pharaoh. And so he challenged Aaron. And Moses went to God and said, God, what am I going to do? He said, I want you to have every man take his staff and plant it outside to stick it in the ground outside of his tent that night. And he said, in the morning, I will give a supernatural manifestation of who I want to be the high priest. Because that dead stick, that rod, will bud It'll have a flower on it in the morning. They got up in the morning, and not only did Aaron's rod bud, it had an almond hanging from it. Leadership, true leadership and authority come from God's throne. And if you ever want to learn how to move in real authority, not usurped authority or illegitimate authority, but real authority, you learn how to get to that throne and you submit to that throne. And then when you turn around, his authority flows through you out into the world. Right. Now, surprising to many of the preachers on TV today, God's commandments are built into his throne. The Ten Commandments, those two tablets, were inside the throne that they carried everywhere they went. Without the commandments, God does not have a throne. The 
The prophet said about the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant, that I'll write my commandments upon your hearts. Well, how can they be done away with if God was writing them on our hearts? It took the cross to get them there. And before the cross, you could only get the commandments in your head, but your heart was always struggling against your head. Your heart wanted to do something else. But with the new birth, the Holy Spirit went in, and when the, that throne was established, God wrote his commandments, his law, his Torah on our hearts. And without that commandment, without that Torah, God does not rule. And now we have preachers that say even the Ten Commandments aren't for the day. They don't, they don't realize when Jesus said, well, you know, what's the greatest commandment of all? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself for the Torah, the law, and the prophets hinge on this. That is actually an encapsula uh, encapsulating the first ten. Because the ten had two sections, how you treat God and how you treat your neighbor. And those ten were an encapsulation of all 613. In fact, Paul took it one step further, and he said, love. He who loves has fulfilled the law. But you gotta be, you got to do love as defined by God. God says, if you love me with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, you're going to keep my commandments. And now we're trying to teach people that you can love God without keeping his commandments. God says that's impossible. And what we do when we take the commandments away from God's people is we're removing the throne of God and its power away from the hearts of God's people. And say, now just let the flesh rule and just call it grace. Then we have manna. There was a jar of manna there. God's supernatural provision. Now I was thinking on this because really, you know, when, when God's throne, and this is where I want all of you guys to get, I want you to get to where you live your life from the throne of God. And if you learn to live your life from the throne of God, you're going to have true biblical authority, you're going to have true supernatural provision, and you're going to have his commandments manifested in your life by the way you conduct yourselves. But you know, I was thinking about that. Did you ever just sit and kind of ponder the word? These are the three things Adam had in the garden. He had commandments in the garden. Go guard my stuff. Keep the Sabbath. He had commandments in the garden. If he had no commandments in the garden, why well, am I know one of the commandments was don't eat of that tree? That was a commandment. He, there were commandments before sin. Otherwise, he could not have sinned. He had to violate a commandment to sin. Therefore, there were commandments before sin. Once sin is rectified, you still have commandments because God brings you to the place that Adam was before the fall. God told him, take dominion. Move in divine authority. That was something he had before the fall that he lost after the fall. And only through Jesus can you ever have true authority and what we're going to get, because we're, I'm starting a new series next week on biblical authority. I'm going to take it a whole different realm than I've ever taken it before, a different route. God's been showing me some things. Did you know you can't have authority on the outside till you take authority on the inside? If you can't take control of your flesh, how in the world do you ever think you're going to take authority over devil? <laughs> we have had a lot of believers... I've read, you know, books like Pigs in the Parlor and, you know, different ones on, on deliverance and stuff. And so you have a group of five people and they're going to cast out demons out of this little girl. You know, she's manifest, you know, and everything. And next thing you turn around to your team members and they're sitting there going, how many know you're in trouble? <laughs> and they're trying to, well, that demon jumped out of her. No, they had buddies. <laughs> Said, you brought my gang with you because you never got control of the flesh. You don't do that stuff unless you have real authority. And God wants you to move in authority. In the days ahead, you're going to have to move in authority because they're trying to take true, and we don't even understand what authority is, but they're trying to take it away from us. Because part of authority is something called self-control. I don't want to preach next week, okay? Whew. 
always saying, Lord, this provide, Lord, this provide. If you ever get to the throne, it flows like a river. In God's river that flows from his throne is his commandments, his authority, and his provision. If you can get to that throne and live from that throne, those three things will begin manifesting in your life. You'll bypass self-sabotage. How many of us said that God starts providing and we do something stupid? Let me tell you something. I put the capital S in stupid, okay, many times in my life. And when I learned to crucify the flesh and to take authority over Michael Lake, I stopped sabotaging myself from the provision of God. Can you see? All three of those are connected. You can't move in God's commandments unless you have enough authority to choose to do them. And as you choose to do them, they increase your authority. It's the threefold cord that is not easily broken. God wants you to intertwine in your life authority, commandments, and provision. God said, if you keep my commandments, you'll drive out the ites. How many know that's authority? If you meditate on my commandments, you will make your way prosperous. There's the manna. They're all intermingled together. And when God, and see, this is, this is where we are right now. We're, and we're in a place in the church where much of the church won't let Jesus rule. They will not let Jesus rule because Jesus will take me out of my sin-padded comfort zone. We can't have people feeling bad about sin because if they feel bad about sin, they begin to tighten up their checkbooks. If they, if they feel convicted, they won't come here. Now, how can I build a mega church if people feel bad when they come in? Did you ever go to the hospital over something? I, I, I remember, you know, I've, I've only had surgery once in my life. Now, after the surgery was over, I didn't wake up feeling so good. Because they had to open up. They had to fix it, take out what needed to be took out, put back in and sew back together what needed to be sewed in. And so after a while, when you have that kind of surgery, how many know you're a little sore? And there are times in God's life God needs to do surgery to take out the sore, to take out the infection, to take out, take out the sin. He's got to convict you before he can deliver you. You've got to, he's got to bring you to a place that you cry out, Hosanna, instead of joining a club. Most people go to church like, like this, this is, this is the blah, blah, blah club. And, you know, I pay my dues every week. And have, have you seen how wonderful the edifice looks for our club? And every club has its own little ways of doing things. And in the church, you, you do not judge someone's spirituality based upon their walk with God. You based it upon how they conform to the culture of that club. For some, I go to the Baptist club. Now we have a formula of how you get wet. And we have a formula of how you just sit there and be reverent the whole church service. And people learn how to do that. You go to a Pentecostal church. And there are certain ways that you conduct yourself to fit in there. How many know that a white Pentecostal church is going to be a whole lot different than a black Pentecostal church? And I might add a black one's more fun. But anyway, but you conduct yourself different and you can, come on, yeah, you, you can do all those things and it looks like it's spiritual. You want a word from God? You can be faking you can be faking it. You can be sitting there all reverent in a Baptist church and fake it and go straight to hell. You can be shouting in a Pentecostal church and faking it and go to hell. You can go to a Hebraic heritage church, keep the feast and keep the Sabbath and go to hell. Because what matters is, is Jesus' throne established in your heart and has the cross been built in you? The tabernacle, it's all the cross. It's the function of that. Without the blood... Well, brother, what about the ones that just preached the cross? Well, if you're really preaching the cross, you're going to end up with the tabernacle. We have a lot of cross-preaching people that don't preach the cross. 
Isn't that an oxymoron? They preach the cross, but it doesn't produce the cross. But you see, if you really get to the cross, then you start putting the brazen altar to work. You put the brazen altar to work, you get the brazen laver going. You get the brazen laver going, you can get the menorah going. You get the menorah going, you can get the table of showbread going. You get it going, you can have the incense altar going. You get it going, then you can finally get into the Holy of Holies and have God's throne established. That's what the apostle talks about. He who has begun a good work in you will finish it. He started you in the outer court, but Jesus said, my goal is to get you before the Father. To get you before the throne. And you begin living your life from the throne on out. That's the purpose of all this. Holiness, and I, I love the throne, it's Holiness within and holiness without. Gold within, layered with gold within, layered with gold without. It's not the Pharisee's cup that had gold on the outside and algae and moss and junk growing on the inside, gangrene growing on the inside. God says, when you're really walking with me, it's gold inside, it's gold outside, it's gold on the bottom, it's gold on the top. That God wants holiness to surround every aspect of our lives. Because where the gold is, the devil can't touch. Where holiness is, the devil can't touch. Jesus said one thing, and it, I, my, my, one of my prayers in my life is, Lord, get me to that place. The devil showed up, and Jesus said, you have nothing in me. You have nothing in me. No open door. No open window. Not even a mouse hole do you have to get into my life. And therefore... And this, this, now this, this is, yeah, I'm going to say this. This kind of shows you where you are. If the devil can trip you up with you all the time, you got open doors. It's actually a sign that you're starting to arrive when all he can do is stir up others around you. He can't get you to do it, so he has to get the pressure from the outside. That's why the Bible says rejoice in persecution. He can't get inside. He's got to persecute from the outside. And when you get there, God can really use you because you got a throne established in your heart and you got some gold going on on the inside and on the outside and the devil can't find a way in. He's on the outside knocking saying, come on, just open the door. Get in the flesh. Get in the flesh. Open the door. Come on, open the door. Choose to walk from that throne. Choose to walk in Jesus' rules and reigns. I have found in my own life that those that have so viciously attacked me in areas were the ones that were the most pitiful. They were really the most pitiful. They had no control of their lives. Their marriages were falling apart. Their finances were falling apart. They go through their lives, and when they go to church, how's it going, brother? Well, that's just wonderful. You're lying through your teeth. You got to hide what's really going on in your life. You tell your kids before they go to church, shh, 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 shh. don't tell anybody anything. Now, what mommy and daddy say at home needs to stay at home. Yes, mommy did fall down the stairs twice, you know, hiding domestic violence, hiding this, hiding that. I mean, no, that's not the way to live. I want you guys to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I want you to get not only happy in church, I want you to get happy in your living room. I want you to get happy in the workplace. I want you to start experiencing victory in every area of your life. And 2013 is the year to learn how to do that. We have an open heaven. When I was in Atlanta, there were other bishops that are all prophetic, and all of them were saying the same thing. They were saying this is the year that it can either be the best year you've ever had or it can be the worst year you ever had because whatever you set your face toward, God's going to increase. If you set it toward the flesh, your flesh is going to get bigger and iniquity is going to get bigger in your life. But if you set it toward God, that throne's going to get so big that nothing else can rise up against it. That's what God wants. God's throne is going to get so big, you got to have the new wineskin to hold it. 
that was that's the intermeshing of God. You know, Mike, you you, you started two weeks on the wine skin, then you get into the tabernacle. Why? Because if you don't have that new wine skin, you can't wrap your head around what I'm talking about. You can't hold what God's wanting to do. The Holy Spirit has got to increase you. Increase your borders, if you will, for what God wants to do in you. And as he does, it's going to be wonderful. There's some of you that all you do your whole life, your whole existence, is just staying one step ahead of poverty. Come on. Just one step ahead of the bills. Just one step ahead of the next sickness. Just one step ahead, if you're lucky. And sometimes it's a half a step. What God wants to take you through is that you have got to look back and use a pair of binoculars to find poverty. You got to look back with binoculars to find sickness. It's so far removed from you. Ruth over her congregation, every year that her and Ricky pray and they say, God, what's the prophetic word for this year? This year is consider your ways. Consider your ways, consider your worship, and consider your wealth. Are all three lining up with the kingdom and the throne? If they are, they'll increase. That's what God wants. It's time for, you know, everybody's used to the federal government increasing. It's time for his kingdom, his governance to increase in you to the place there's no room left found for the devil. Now, Father, I just lift up everyone who listens to this. Father, I just loose a supernatural anointing in their lives to be able to come before your throne and to surrender. Father, we can't dance before the throne until we fall before the throne. And just surrender it all. And Father, as we do, you're going to loose new authority, new provision, and the power of your kingdom and commandments in our lives. And Father, we ask that you would loose that anointing, that it would begin driving out the ites in our lives, that we could walk before you as a people free and holy and empowered by the kingdom. And Father, we thank you. And we praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.